Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, our first uh, talk of the afternoon session is Managing Circospora Leaf Spot by Mixing Cultivars. Uh, authors are Peter Hawk and Dr. Mohammed Khan. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you had a good lunch and thank you very much for being here today and listening to the results of all the research that's being conducted despite everything that's going on in the world. Uh, hopefully this year things will get much better and we can meet again in person and at meetings and in-person plot tours and other events. Um, so here's hoping that 2021 is a much better year for all of us. Um, anyways, my name is Peter Hawk. I'm Dr. Mohammed Khan's technician here at North Dakota State University in the plant pathology department. Um, and I wanna talk about a trial that we've done for a few years now looking at controlling Cercospora leaf spot in sugar beets. So we've obviously gone over this before, um, but just a quick overview, but uh, Cercospora leaf spot and sugar beet is an extremely damaging disease and is the most destructive foliar disease on sugar beets in both North Dakota and Minnesota. And it's a major problem in all growing districts, but especially the further south that you go. Um, it's a fungal disease and infects the leaves of sugar beets, um, typically starting when the rows close around the 1st of July, give or take a week or two. Um, it thrives on days and nights with um, higher humidity and rainfall. It kills the leaves and um, can possibly cause the roots to have more impurities when the time comes for harvest and processing, in addition to causing a lower sucrose concentration. Um, we know there are several ways to control this disease, including fungicide applications, uh, cultural methods such as longer crop rotation, and trying to keep beets away from a field planted with beets the previous year, and using tolerant varieties. And so thinking about tolerant varieties was the basis for this trial. Um, a few years ago, we started a trial looking at the possibilities of mixing seed varieties to help control um, diseases in this particular sense, Cercospora leaf spot, in combination with fungicide use, um, and to see if there's a certain percentage of mixtures that leads to better disease control. Um, so variety selection is a method that's been used to control diseases in the past over many different crops, maybe even all the crops. Um, however, solely relying on one genetic variation can be a risk. Um, in the 1960s, a single genetic strain of corn became more and more widely adopted. And by 1970, 85% of the corn planted in the United States and Canada had the same genetic background. Um, Southern corn leaf blight was not a new disease at that time. It had been observed um, since the 1920s, um, but there had been increasing reports in scattered areas around the corn belt in the late 1960s, and especially starting in 1969, of larger outbreaks of the disease due to a mutation. Um, starting in early spring of 1970, uh, reports came early and came often from southern states of serious leaf damage to corn um, helped along because of an unusually wet spring. Well, by mid-July, the disease had stretched up the Mississippi Valley all the way to far southern Minnesota and into Wisconsin. And when the year was done, an estimated 15% of the entire corn crop in the United States and Canada were destroyed. And some individual, grow, individual growers, especially in the South, lost 100% of their corn on their farms. Um, and in the aftermath of this outbreak, um, geneticists decided that the industry couldn't solely rely on one single genetic line as the only means to control a disease. So in the years and the decades since then, a more balanced approach has occurred in crop production that looks at multiple ways of controlling disease and raising a good crop. And varieties and genetic variation are definitely part of that. Um, researchers at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Research Centre, Ontario, Canada, a few years ago said that they were looking at possible ways to mix corn hybrids in a hopper uh, and not just planting different strips of varieties in a field. Um, they said there's a potential in mixing varieties to allow for a certain variety to avoid insect damage, um, disease development, lack of moisture or excess moisture and allow a field to succeed if one variety is susceptible to those outside influences. Um, however, they also noted that this is not without possible drawbacks. Uh, different varieties would have different moisture contents that would complicate harvest and pollination could take longer if varieties are mixed together, also delaying harvest um, among other issues that they brought up. So it's something that is still being looked at. Uh, however, mixing varieties is something that is sometimes used by wheat growers um, a 2001 survey in Kansas found that winter wheat blends uh, were the fourth most popular variety planted by growers there. Um, however, a later study by the University of Minnesota tested whether several blends had a yield advantage and they found no increase in yield and protein, but it is something that's done um, by some growers, mixing uh, different varieties that is. Um, so we looked at mixing different varieties of sugar beets with varying levels of CLS tolerance at different percentages. Uh, however, like what I mentioned earlier, there are drawbacks to using two varieties at one time, like what we mentioned with corn. Um, there are different times to maturity, 
So the canopy will develop at different times with different varieties. And also different varieties have different amounts of the beet crown exposed above the soil line. So at harvest time, defoliation will be difficult because the topper might be set perfectly for one variety, um, but you might be severely damaging the other variety or vice versa. You might not be taking enough of the green material off. Um, however, we wanted to give it a try. So we picked four different varieties from two companies and mixed the ones from similar companies at rates of 25-75, 50-50, 75-25, and then each variety separately, and then applied um, standard fungicides to one set and then left the other set untreated. We started this trial back in 2017, but the first two years, um, it didn't really turn out for us. In 2017, we planted it at our Hickson research site, and despite inoculating it um, the same way that we inoculate a regular Foxholm Cercosper leaf spot site, uh, we just didn't get good disease development that year. CLS didn't really set in until the very end, and so we ended up seeing more of, of a variety effect than testing for Cercosper leaf spot effects on those varieties. So the next year, we also tried to plant it at the Hickson site, and we were starting to get some good disease growth, but then in mid-August, um, this happened. We were hit with the biggest hailstorm that I've seen in my years uh, working at NDSU. It honestly looked kind of like a bad defoliation job, and there was so much hail that there were actually still some hailstones left there the next morning. So that year was obviously um, lost again. Tough to do a study looking at um, leaf disease when you don't have many much for leaves left late in the year like that. Um, so again, like in 2017, we just couldn't use this data because we ended up testing more of the variety than the effect of Cercosper leaf spot on those varieties. Um, so starting in 2019, we planted it at our Foxhole, Minnesota CLS site. And here is some information from that year. So last, or I guess now two summers ago, we planted it on May 17th. We harvested the plots on September 24th and we inoculated them on July 12th. We applied four rounds of fungicide sprays on July 22nd, on August 1st, August 15th, and then again on August 29th. For the first set of varieties, the CLS ratings were 5.2 and 4.2, um, and the second set of CLS ratings were 5.6 and 4.4. So in 2019, we had good, but not overwhelming CLS pressure. And here are the results for the plots that did not have fungicides applied. Um, and you can see that the 100% uh, resistant variety really stood out. Um, in the top set, um, you can see that the 100% resistant variety was better than all other treatments in the CLS ratings and statistically better than all other treatments in the sugar percentage and sucrose per ton columns. And it was the same story on the bottom, um, the bottom half of the chart um, in variety set number two, except that the CLS ratings were more even. Uh, but by the time you move over to the sugar percentage column and the sucrose per ton column, the 100% resistant variety really stood out above all the other treatments. So when you move over to the fungicide treatments, you can see that there was only one treatment that was significantly different from the 100% susceptible variety in the top set when it comes to CLS ratings. And that was the 100% resistant variety. When you look at the yield column, there were significant differences, but they were with the susceptible varieties being better. Um, and that's because since we controlled the disease so well with fungicides, and essentially, we essentially took the disease out of the equation, um, and the susceptible variety was uh, quite a bit better absent outside influences. Um, when it comes to sugar percentage, the resistant variety and blends of at least 50% uh, were the best. And then you can carry that over to the sucrose per ton column where the two worst performing treatments were the susceptible variety and the 75% susceptible variety. Um, in the second set, there were less significant differences overall, but it was the same pattern in the sugar percentage and the sucrose per ton columns with the susceptible variety and the 75% blend being significantly less than resistant variety and the 75% resistant variety. So in 2020, uh, we did the trial again at the Fox Home sites. Um, we planted the plots on May 4th. Uh, we harvested them on September 28th. And this year we inoculated the plots on July 6th. Um, the plots were, uh, fungicides were applied to the plots on July 22nd, August 3rd, August 13th, and August 26th. Um, and the first set of CLS ratings uh, were 5.2 and 4.1. And the second set of CLS ratings were 5.0 and 4.7. And in 2020, we had overwhelming CLS pressure. Um, in late June, July, and early August, it seemed like it was just always raining at our Foxhole, Minnesota plots. And we had standing water in at least parts of our plot area for the entire month of July. So controlling CLS was a challenge this past summer. 
Um, in the non-fungicide treatments, as you can see here, um, you can really see the effects of the high CLS pressure uh, year that we dealt with where all the ratings in both sets of varieties were at or above 8.5. Um, and then when you get to the sucrose percentage and sucrose per acre and sucrose per ton columns, the treatments under 50% resistance uh, were the lowest and were significantly different from the treatments with more tolerant varieties in, in both sets. So looking at the data uh, for the treatments that receive fungicides, um, there were significant differences in the top set of data between almost all of the treatments. And there was a gradually descending trend as you go from the 100% susceptible to the 100% tolerant variety. Um, following the trend in 2019, the 100% susceptible and 75% susceptible were significantly different from the resistant variety in the sugar percentage column. But this year, the 50-50 blend was also different um, and also in the sucrose per ton column. If you look at the sucrose per acre column, there's a pretty sharp cutoff between the 75% susceptible variety and the 50-50 treatment. In the second set of treatments, we see the same trend in the CLS ratings where they gradually decrease from the susceptible to the resistant variety. And we also see the same trend in the sucrose columns and the sucrose per acre columns and the sucrose per ton column where there's a noticeable drop off when you get under the 50-50 blend. And so here's some pictures that um, we took of the plots in mid-August. Um, first of the plots without fungicides, you can see the progression um, from susceptible to tolerant varieties, um, especially in that top set, um, Sir Cosper just really did a number on, on really both of the varieties and, and the mixtures in between. The bottom set did a little bit better, but it was, as we mentioned earlier, a very heavy year for Sir Cospera. Um, and now here's the plots with fungicides and you can see the same thing, um, just obviously better control since we were actually using the fungicides. Um, so what does all this mean? So we've looked at a lot of the numbers and uh, pictures. And the takeaway is that as you increase the percentage of seed that is tolerant of Cercospora leaf spot, the yield statistics do go up if there's disease present. Um, it shows that fungicides are very helpful and that tolerance to CLS is also needed under severe conditions. And that somewhere around the 50% mixture is where you can start to see an increase in yield over the 100% susceptible variety. Um, the varieties that were the most resistant performed the best, especially in 2020, uh, because of the rain that made fungicide applications difficult. So we need fungicides to control this disease, but we also need genetics as a backstop uh, when rainfall is high, like in 2020. So we'll look at this for another year to see if what happened in 2019 and 2020 is confirmed. Um, and this trial is just uh, being performed for academic reasons and not to make a recommendation for growers to mix seed. It's simply to answer a question that we had. And so with that, I want to say thank you to uh, all the sugar beet seed companies that have helped us over the years, giving us seed, not just for these trials, but for all the trials that we've done. Same thing for the chemical companies that have given us products to use. We're really, really thankful for both of those. Uh, and also to Kevin Etzler, our Fox Home cooperator, Vince Alstead and Terry Thompson up at Hickson, and then the whole NDSU and U of M sugar beet team for helping with um, everything from planting to spraying to harvest. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for listening. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Hello, Peter. This is Kimberly Webb. Um, the question I have is one of the benefits of using mixtures is not just for protecting against the fungicide resistance of Cercospora, but also maintaining the resistance um, that you're using to protect as well within the sugar beet plant. Um, were you using only a single source of resistant line or did you have multiple resistance? Are you going to look at multiple resistances and using those as a mixture? instead of a susceptible versus resistant line? For this, so far we've just used, yeah, no, we have not looked at different basis of, of resistance. Just, we've just been taking uh, market varieties and, and looking at those, but that's definitely a good question to think about for future, um, for future runs of this trial. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. All right, thank you. All right, our next presenter is Ms. Uh, co-author with Dr. Khan, and it is the role of adjuvants with fungicides under stimulated rainfall at controlling Cercospora baticula in sugar beet. Thank you. So welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is MD Zia Rahman Buya. Today I am going to talk about role of adjuvants with fungicide under simulated rainfall for controlling Cercospora. Uh, particular in sugar beet. 
Sugar beet is an important sugar yielding crop in the United States. Here, North Dakota and Minnesota are two leading sugar beet producing states in the United States. Here, American Crystal Sugar Company, Minda Farmers Cooperative, Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative combinedly contributed approximately 57% of total U.S. sugar production, which is corresponding to $5 billion economy. But sugar beet production is highly influenced my high, uh, production is highly influenced by sarcospora pedicola sarcospora leaf spot disease which is a major foliar destructive disease caused by sarcospora pedicola is an hemibiotropic polycyclic fungus it has significant impact on uh, sugar beet uh, productions that it causes yield loss up to 40 percent or even more in severe condition reduced sugar quality and causes huge monetary loss as well as reduce storability in the piles but sugar beet for better management of sugar beet, yes, sarcospora leaf spot, currently growers are highly recommended to uh, use tolerant variety if available, tillage operation, crop rotation with non-host crop for two to three years, and as well as timely spraying of fungicide for better control. But application of fungicide and efficacy of fungicide losses due to many reasons, especially environmental factors like wind, heat, solar radiation, rain, and irrigation, among them, rain is an important factor that immediate after spraying fungicide causes uh, fungicide losses be, uh, due to washing off, redistribution, deposits, and residual activity of fungicide. And sometimes after a spraying of fungicide, if rainfall happens, that fungicide takes away to the near, uh, runoff to the near uh, water wires that causes serious environmental pollutions too. Last year and this year, the rainfall pattern in Foxholm that indicating that mostly in uh, uh, in the growing season there was less rain compared to this year in 2020, and uh, at least 41 percent precipitation chance uh, daily precipitation chance was in Foxholm in this year. So adjuvants is a product adjuvants kind of product that other than fungicide formulation fungicide that added in a spray tank improve the efficacy of fungicide. When the spray solution without adjuvants added because of higher surface tension, it has lower weighting capacity. But when added with adjuvants, it improves the, uh, it improves the, uh, reduce the surface tension and improves the uh, no, better, uh, better uh, coverage on the spray surface. So we set the objectives to st uh, study the effect of simulated rainfall for evaluating the effectiveness of fungicide and adjuvant for controlling sarcospora leaf spot. The research was conducted both at an AES and ESU greenhouse and field at Foxholm, Minnesota. We use a variety, sugar beet variety, which is highly susceptible to uh, sarcospora beticola. So we use different amount of rainfall, 0.1 inch, quarter inch, 0.5 inch and one inch rainfall. And then rainfall was simulated artificially using a spray booth chamber at NDSU greenhouse at one hour after fungicide spray, one days, three days, and five days. Evaluation, uh, we evaluate the sarcospora CLS severity using one to 10 scale after 14 days post inoculation of sarcospora viticola. We use three different type of fungicide from Pizel group, we, we use Inspire XT, from EBDC group, we used Pencojeb, and from copper fungicide, we used HSC. We used two different kinds of adjuvants, complex and transfix. Complex, especially known for its penetrator, penetrating and translipating activity. Transfix is mostly a spreader or a sticker that has waterproofing protection from the rain. So in the greenhouse, we spray fungicide or fungicide adjuvant mixture followed by rainfall simulation, different amount, different time. And then after that, we inoculate sarcospora beticola and incubate it in humidity chamber for four days and then transferred the, transfer the plant to the greenhouse. Then after 14 days post inoculation, we evaluate the disease severity. For spraying fungicide and adjuvant mixture, we use a special uh, nozzle that's turbo twin jets, TT660, 60, 110 degree, that has two 110 degree flat fan spray that can move 60 degree back and forth that provide wider spray depth compared to conventional flat fan nozzle, that uh, and as well as reduce the drip with desired size of droplets 
on the spray surface. We also use uh, water sensitive spot card to ensure how the droplets distributions, indicating the best coverage and uniform distribution using carbo twin jet. That with fungicide droplets seems uniform global, uh, globular on the surface, but when added with adjuvants, indicate spray droplets wider and become merged and ensure excellent coverage to the leaf surface. Uh, rain, in, uh, when we use Inspire and after a different uh, amount of rainfall simulations, one hour after fungicide spray, one day, three day and five day. And then after, and then when we added complex and adjuvants with Inspire, we see, uh, all the treatment, treatment one is treated check and treatment 18 is non-treated uh, inoculated checks. Immediate after spraying fungicide that, uh, however, the amount of uh, rainfall simulated, it uh, reduces the effectiveness of fungicide. But for all, um, up, to, up to one days, one hour and one days, and five inch, one inch rainfall that uh, reduce the effectiveness of fungicide, increase high disease severity. But over time, when, uh, when we spread uh, rainfall, uh, did rainfall simulation at three days and five days, that reduced the uh, disease severity, that's literally improved the efficacy. But all the treatments, they are not significantly different, but they are significantly different from the treated check. When added complex, that improves the efficacy of fungicidal activity. And uh, initially, when uh, at one hour uh, after fungicide spray, when we added any amount of rainfall at one inch, quarter inch, half inch, and one inch, that yeah, uh, uh, decrease the eff effectiveness of fungicide. But over time, when we spray fungicide, that show more or less similar pattern, except one inch rainfall showed the differences. Likewise, for PencoJEP rainfall and PencoJEP plus complex, uh, from that two combination, PencoJEP. And uh, Pencoje Plus Complex improved the efficacy of fungicide and showed lower disease severity. Only at one inch rainfall and five inch rainfall initially at one hour showed that this higher disease severity that indicates fungicide lose its efficacy controlling sarcosporolis spot. Over time, at one day, three days, and five days showed more or less similar trend that increasing the amount of rainfall, decreasing the uh, increasing the disease severity. Still at, at one day only, at one inch rainfall, reduce the efficacy of fungicide. Improving, uh, at using complex that improve efficacy of fungicide, uh, it indicates only uh, one inch, point one inch and point, uh, five inch rainfall didn't show that much effect compared to the, the checks. But, well, and five inch and one, one inch rainfall show a big difference compared to and one inch and quarter inch rainfall when we added complex and rainfall. Uh, and then badge SC from copper fungicides when we added rainfall and added with complex, it shows uh, whatever the amount of rainfall added uh, after fun uh, fungicide is spray, it shows effectiveness of edge fungicides that reduce that shows higher disease severity uh, over time of uh, 0.1 inch and 0.5 in, uh, 0.25 inch rainfall show more or less similar effect for the rest of the time one day three day and five day. and five inch and one one inch rainfall show the similar trend of uh, the severity and effectiveness of fungicide of uh, when added complex with batch fungicide that shows uh, uh, improved efficacy of fungicide a little bit, but still higher amount of fungi, uh, rainfall simulation like 0.5 inch and one inch show a big difference. But at one after one uh, from one days, three days and five days, only one inch rainfall show the differences. Other uh, no, but uh, up to 0.5 inch uh, the fungicide showed good efficacy with reduced disease severity. We added also, we also use other, uh, another type of uh, adjuvants, Transpix with Inspire, Ecojep, uh, and Badge. So it's indicating when uh, Inspire provided better control. Competing is at uh, for Inspire and Ecojep at five days, they showed more or less similar trend of uh, effectiveness in both cases when rainfall simulated up to. Uh, uh, and one inch and quarter inch, but in all other cases, 
uh, increasing the amount of rainfall simulation, increase, uh, increasing the disease severity. Uh, compared to Pankojeb and Badge, Badge perform better compared to Pankojeb when use uh, transfix in all cases. Initially up to one uh, for Badge for one, uh, three, uh, one days, higher disease, uh, higher amount of rainfall, rainfall simulation increases the disease severity. But later on, uh, at three days and five days, disease severity reduce, indicating the fungicide works well. Uh, if uh, rainfall happen after three days and five days of fungicide spray. Uh, this is badge SC uh, when mixed with transfix at different time point. And in this year, field experiment at Foxholm in Minnesota in 2020, uh, uh, all treatments indicating that treatment are significantly different from the inoculated check uh, from all the combination that only inspire XT as complex uh, this showed low, lowest disease severity, uh, lowest disease severity compared to other adjuvant use transfix with other fungicide like pentojeb and Baz. Uh, but rotation works uh, more or less similar. Uh, it's happened, but initially in this year, uh, the disease control was fairly good. But later in the season, uh, June, July and August rainfall was uh, more and more. So that gives reduce, uh, a lower disease control this year. Uh, this is the non-treated checks of disease control uh, of adjuvant trial in at Foxum this year. Edge, edge plus con complex, Nkojeb, Nkojeb plus complex, and Inspire, and Inspire is completely looks green. It's provided better control. From the above discussion, we can conclude rainfall reduced the effectiveness of fungicide. Rainfall event uh, immediate after fungicide spray resulted higher CLS severity compared to treated check. Rainfall amount of uh, 0.1 inch at quarter inch uh, cannot uh, affect that much of fungicidal efficacy. Higher disease severity observed if rainfall simulated 0.5 inch and 1 inch. Uh, disease severity reduced uh, over time, especially at three days after fungicide spray and five days. Uh, inspire XT better than com pancojeb if it's sprayed alone or mixed with complex. Transfix perform better when added with badge than pancojeb plus transfix mixture. And field experiment inspire plus complex showed better efficacy than pancojeb and badge as the fungicide. So I would like to thank my uh, research advisor, Professor Dr. Mohammed Khan, for his continuous support and guideline. And would like to thank uh, for the technical support for Dr. Khan's lab member, Dr. Yang Shi Liu and Peter Hack. And I would like to again thank Sugarbeet Research Education Board for funding my research. And last, uh, my and, uh, department and DC plant pathology department. Thank you very much, everybody, for your patience hearing. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we do have two questions in the QA box. Uh, the first question is How did you simulate rainfall? Uh, uh, thank you very much. We did uh, rainfall simulation. Uh, we used uh, a sprayer booth at NDSU Greenhouse. We calibrated the amount of rainfall per hour, uh, like one inch, 0.25 inch, uh, five inch and one inch uh, uh, to see uh, uh, to see the uh, effectiveness of fungicide, that how much fungicide loss and how disease severity, either fungicide uh, affects disease severity or not. So John will be talking about protection of sugar beet seedlings from BNYVV using double-stranded RNA technology. Um, so I guess starting off with, you know, we've heard a lot about Cercospora this morning now, and if, if Cercospora is the disease that needs no introduction, then certainly Rhizomania is the one that has gotten its own YouTube channel is approaching, is approaching quickly from behind. So. But that said, I think everybody knows that rhizomania is a, is a global disease of, of very high importance. Uh, this is partially because uh, the fact that you cannot uh, have any fungicides or any virucides or any bactericides that can work to control the disease. Um, rhizomania gets its name from the symptoms that are seen in this photograph right here at the bottom from KWS. Uh, rhizomania essentially translates to crazy root instead of getting a nice smooth taproot that uh, is high in sugar, high in yield, you instead get this pr proliferation of side uh, roots 
that uh, and root hairs that essentially compromise the disease. Uh, inside of that hairy root mass, if you do a cross section of the beetroot, you will see a high amount of necrosis that uh, prevents accumulation of sugar and accumulation of yield. Um, so this disease is quite severe, quite concerning. And as you'll hear throughout the talk, although there is some genetic resistance uh, that they use in the crop to control rhizomania in fields that have the disease, um, there are some concerns about uh, the uh, durability of some of that resistance, its effectiveness. Um, and yet at the same time, I don't think there's cause for alarm at this point. So just a little bit of background on the disease for those who may not have been introduced to it uh, much in their, in their past. Um, it is caused by a virus called beet necrotic yellow vein virus. So even though it's uh, rhizomania disease is a root disease and affects the roots, um, it's, it was initially discovered and characterized based on a leaf necrosis that is caused by the disease when uh, it, it infects up through the root and up into the veins. The virus itself does not exist by itself in the soil. It actually exists within these uh, cystosauri, these polymyxa uh, beta uh, organism resting spores. And that, that was, this would be like a root hair of the sugar beet that has those spores inside of it. So when the end of the season comes around and um, the beets are harvested and these are left in the soil, this is where your inoculum source is coming in from the, from the previous year. As we mentioned, uh, polymyxa nor B and YVV are controlled by any of the treatments that you normally put on the seed, like apron thyram or even the tachygarin that you put on the seed for the control of um, aphanomyces, for example. Um, and so really genetic resistance is the, the form of resistance and the form of control that we have for this disease in sugar beet. Um, shortly after rhizomania was discovered in Minnesota in the, the mid to late 1990s, um, the gene RZ1, which is already known for resistance, it's a single dominant gene that was deployed by the sugar beet seed companies and many of the varieties. And um, that was given good resistance, but eventually it did break down. And it was good that at that time, they already had another gene called RZ2 that was waiting in the wings that they could um, also breed into the varieties that are sold to the growers commercially. And RZ2 and RZ1 now are deployed in quite a number of the varieties. It's almost hard to find anything that is RZ1 alone or a susceptible variety anymore because of the proactive desire to make sure that we keep uh, rhizomania at bay. So again, um, this picture down here just shows what you might see in a field that has rhizomania. Um, this would be a field that has what we call blinkers where some of the beets, um, for one reason or another, uh, isolated beets are uh, accumulating the virus and showing the yellowing in the leaves which is a characteristic symptom uh, in the field for this disease. And many of these beets then if you were to pull them up would have this root symptom that you see um, over here on the lower right. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do is keep monitoring what's happening with the BNYVV. As I mentioned, we did have uh, isolates that were overcoming the resistance in RZ1. And in recent years, we are beginning uh, to be concerned about uh, the possibility of RZ1 plus RZ2 varieties also being overcome. Uh, our concern is really no different than what you hear about for coronavirus for all of us. Uh, you know, you're constantly monitoring to see if um, you have new strains, new variants that are going to compromise the crop that you're trying to grow. So the way this is done is that whenever there are some problem fields that crop up, we request some soil to be sent to us. And then on the, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here on this, but um, on the left-hand side, we have pots that we plant seeds in. Those, uh, those pots contain um, soil that's mixed with sand so that we get good expression of the disease. We typically look at RZ1, RZ2, and then RZ1 plus RZ2 varieties that we plant. We pull those roots up at about five to six weeks post planting. We prepare the roots for an ELISA test, an immunological test for the virus. And then we go ahead and grind the samples up, put them in these plates that will have an antibody react with them. And if there's a virus in there, we will get a yellow color in the plate at, shown at the bottom right. So that basically is the test. We have a plate reader that we put that plate on and we're able to see quantitatively how much yellow is in those plates. And that gives us some idea um, of the intensity or the level of the virus that was in there. So next slide. Okay, so on the left, there, that would be a typical field that would have some blinkers in it, maybe even a little bit more severe than blinkers. This was in the Southern Minnesota area, but this year we did receive samples from 
all of the cooperatives, just more from southern Minnesota because um, of the severity that was cropping up in some of those fields down there. Um, at the right hand side, you can see the table that we have that is illustrating the um, reactions based on having planted a susceptible, an RZ1 containing hybrid, an RZ2 containing hybrid, and an RZ1 plus RZ2 containing hybrid. And as you can see the susceptibles, we have several that are cropping up as being positive. With RZ1, almost all of those are overcoming RZ1 as well. Um, and then with the RZ1 plus RZ2, which is the one the growers would be most concerned about because those are the varieties that they typically are planting in their fields. We do have a couple that are of concern, although not as many as if you're looking at just the susceptibles or RZ1 alone. So the good news actually is that um, even though we receive samples in that are suspect, um, only a few of those for the RZ1 plus RZ2 are truly coming up as positive. And yet we've been, we've been uh, witnessing this for several years now, and we have yet to see any whole field uh, just become swamped with this type of, of rhizomania that would be taking this over. So, um, so I, we feel that that's actually a good, a good uh, point that as we monitor this, we are still getting good control out of those varieties. Now for the first year ever with the RZ2, we've always included an RZ2 alone. And in previous years, we had not seen really any um, BNYVV overcome the RZ2 alone. That variety is not anything you would really concern yourself about because um, RZ2 alone typically um, is just an experimental line. They have not implemented RZ2 alone varieties for commercial use purposes. And they went directly to RZ1 plus RZ2 for maximum control. However, the fact that there are a couple of spots where we found BNYVV that could overcome RZ2 alone are something we want to keep an eye on in terms of our investigations to see how changes in the BNYVV population might be affecting that. So in, in the you know, near future, our top priority remains that we want to examine virus for mutational changes that might be occurring. Additionally, we want to use more sophisticated techniques these days to examine total virus population for new players, new viruses that might be impacting the crop in a similar way. So next slide. Until then, uh, genetic resistance to rhizomania disease remains the most cost-effective and most efficacious method to, to control uh, this disease. As I mentioned, several genes have already been deployed to combat the disease, namely RZ1 and RZ2. There are additional genes that these seed companies are continuing, con continually looking at and trying to isolate. In addition to their efforts, um, we have a new geneticist, Dr. Chengen Chu in our group, uh, who you heard from earlier, who will be looking into some of the wild germplasm collections that we have in, 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 with the possibility of finding new genes for rhizomania resistance. Um, but even given that, there's a relatively long lag time, anywhere from six years, to incorporate new genes by standard breeding and selection methods and putting them into elite hybrids. So one of the things we've been doing is looking at novel methods, novel approaches, that might be used either as a seed dressing or some other method of application for com combating rhizomania. One of these methods would be the newly emerging DSRNA or double-stranded RNA technology and investigating how they might fit into this role. Interestingly, some people have already may, maybe have heard of some of the leading products in this area. Uh, there is uh, a, a product undergoing registration, I believe right now for Colorado potato beetle control that is essentially a double-stranded RNA molecule used to uh, downregulate a gene that that insect requires for its, uh, its feeding and reproduction. Uh, irrespective of the many different ways that DSRNA can be used, it is an excellent candidate for the technology for virus control. So the next slide will kind of show how we've, we began using this. Um, we use it uh, by starting with untreated seed. And um, the untreated seed um, that we have is a susceptible variety. If we germinate seeds in a petri dish so that we're just getting the radicals, so those, those tiny root piece to emerge from the seed, and we mix that with double-stranded RNA, it did have another uh, thing here that is missing. A, a double-stranded RNA, as you all know about the double helix, many of you have been introduced to use the TV shows or whatever of the DNA double helix. Double-stranded RNA looks almost like exactly like double-stranded DNA, like the helix. And we just take small snippets of that double-stranded RNA that match the genome of the virus we're trying to control, mix it in with uh, the seeds, put it in a cuvette, uh, which is shown on the left-hand side there. That cuvette has electrodes on the side of it. So the seeds float to the bottom in a buffer solution in that chamber. 
And when they're subjected to a, a quick pulse of electrical charge, the double-stranded DNA can actually get into the, the tissue, into the cells that are on the outside of the emerging seed uh, radical. Those seedlings then are planted into test soil that has rhizomania in there. And after five to six weeks, we pull the plants up and we look at the percentage of the seeds that are infected. And as you can see that if we have plus the DSRNA in the table on the, in the chart on the far right, when you have DSRNA, the number of seedlings that get infected are quite a bit reduced compared to when you have no DSRNA in there. And that this uh, particular chart is a summation of several experiments um, where we see this effect uh, consistently revealed. If you go to the next slide now, uh, during this time, we actually had, uh, had the chance to buy a new electroporator. So this is the device that actually delivers the electric pulse. It's a new, more flexible electroporator. And we purchased that on information from the literature that suggested that using a square wave instead of an exponential decay wave was better at actually getting DNA and RNA into intact cells. And so that was one of our first uh, parameters that we wanted to evaluate. And so you can see that um, your pulse, your electrical discharge can either be a sustained square wave or it can be a rather fast exponential uh, decay. And uh, the, the exponential decay is what we're using previously. The data below now are using the exponential square wave. And although we are still seeing um, con uh, better control when we add the DSRNA and use electroporation of these seeds in this case, the mortality is higher. So if you look in both the plus DSRNA and the minus DSRNA columns, you see the um, number of plants that were infected, but you also see the number of survivors in parentheses. And so you can see that out of 12 seeds electroporated, if we're only getting six to five uh, surviving, then that means we need to tweak our parameters a little bit so we don't have such high lethality. But we're very glad to have this new piece of equipment to be able to investigate these because we get much more data on the pulse that was delivered, on the conditions that the seeds undergo. Um, so we feel this is going to be a great addition to our, to our project. Next slide. Next, next one. Okay, so um, just in, in you summation, just about um, a minute, oh, sorry. Johnny. you have just what? about a minute here to wrap up. Yep, that's it. So we're very glad about our uh, inclusion of Dr. Vinita Ramachandran, who's our new virologist uh, to our group. And um, we feel that her contributions are gonna be uh, really excellent. Her background experience is gonna be excellent uh, in terms of contributing to the control of rhizomania and other diseases. We now have infectious clones that Dr. Alyssa Flovenis had made. Um, in the laboratory to begin to investigate the resistance breaking by the NYVV. And we will continue to refine and scale the DSRNA tests to allow the development of technology for ultimate implementation in the field, most likely as a seed adjuvant. Um, as a generalized approach, DSRNA will continue to offer unprecedented potential, both in pest and disease control. Um, and it may in the future be used experimentally to alter metabolism in order to shift production to desired products or outcomes in the proposed uh, and proposed for the induction of temporary male sterility, even in plant breeding. So I will just close off there and just go to the last slide just to thank some people, Dr. Bolton for hosting me in his laboratory, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board of Minnesota, of course, for supporting this research. And in addition, the uh, field and lead agronomists and the cooperatives who along with the seed companies and through the Beet Sugar Development, the development Foundation support this research. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, excellent talk in spite of the technical, technological issues. Um, there are a few questions on the Q&A. If you could just answer those offline, that'd be great. Okay. I'll stop sharing so we can move on to the next speaker. Okay. So I don't need to do anything. Okay. Nope. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next speaker is... Uh, Dr. Shukchanda uh, with co-author Jason Brantner talking about management of full season rhizoctonia in sugar beet. Thank you, Melvin. Can you see my screen in the presentation mode? Yeah, you're, you're good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, a lot of excellent presentations uh, since this morning. You know, I just want to shift some gears here because I think we heard a lot of uh, CASPER related talks. Uh, but I think it's time to look at some of the rhizoctonia control for 2021. 
But at the outset, I would like to actually thank Jason uh, for, for all his contributions towards my program since 2014. So he just decided to uh, go to the American Crystal Sugar Company. It's a bittersweet uh, feeling for me, but I'm glad he's still with the sugar beet industry. So thank you very much, Jason, for all your contributions here. Uh, you know, one thing I always talk about, you know, when it comes to, you know, disease diagnosis, especially with the root diseases, I mean, it could be tricky, right? Number one, these are below ground. Number two, they are look alike. You know, sometimes it's very difficult even for us, unless we plate them in cultures and see whether it's exactly Rhizectonia or Phenomyces. Just looking at my uh, samples from 2020, uh, most of the samples actually were Rhizectonia. We did get some samples for Phenomyces, about 13. We got about 90 samples in total, 89. And there are some fields, you know, it's always common to recover both Rhizectonia and Aphanomyces, sometimes, you know, from the same root or sometimes from the different roots from the same field, you know, from the same subsample there. The number of samples for Fusarium went a little bit lower in 2020. And I'm glad to see that because we got about 11 samples, you know, that actually was a red flag in 2019, because the only thing we can do for Fusarium right now is, uh, uh, selecting a tolerant or resistant variety. We did see some PDM, you know, it's not uncommon. If you have some standing water in the fields, you know, you could get some PDM root rot and the chemical uh, uh, damage. And then others, you know, it could include anything related to abiotic stress or, uh, you know, even the wind damage, you know, some of those uh, samples there. But I think, uh, again, my point here is, uh, when you see something wrong in your field, you know, please send your samples. We will be doing this diagnosis again in 2021, 20, uh, so uh, you know how to find us. And looking at the overall rain, rainfall pattern in 2020, uh, April and May, you know, very typical for our growing areas here, but I see more rain in St. Thomas in June. But as we went into July and August, I think a little bit of uh, more rain in July and August, but you know, that could uh, actually reflect of uh, what I have seen in fields in terms of Sarcospora and then other speakers have shown some good pictures. In September, October, thank God it was not uh, 2019, you know, we could get in and get out uh, as quickly as possible to harvest these beets. When it comes to Rhizectonia, you know, it's a full season pathogen. So when I say full season, the time we, we put the seed in the ground, you know, that's when Rhizectonia gets into action. So it causes, pre or post emergence damping off. So with the post emergence damping off, what we see basically is uh, an acrosis just at the soil line. Um, and then, you know, you're gonna lose uh, this particular seedling and you will lose stands early on. But as you go later into the season, uh, the biggest risk, I mean, it could occur any time during the growing season until harvest, you know, that's a root rot. Like I said, the challenge is it's underground. So, you just need to find it in a nice dry, hot afternoon and you know, scout your fields. And if you see some wilting, you know, this is not like a reversible wilting, you know, typically you know, it will deteriorate over time, but all you need to, you need to dig up those roots and look at, look at them. Uh, what you see if it's Rhizactonia, you see these distinct lesions, you know, really dark color. It could be anywhere. It could be next to the crown. It could be very bottom, or it could be just somewhere in the middle of the root, but it really depends on where the inoculum is present in the soil. Sometimes you see a ladder-like pattern for this. Um, but what happens when these beets die in the field? Uh, basically, you know, Rhizoctonia will take another form. It's, uh, it makes these melanized overwintering structures. We call them sclerotia. So typically these could survive in the soil for two to three years. So, you know, by the time you get into the same field with beets, you know, it's, it's live and kicking and then ready to infect the beets. So that's the impact you have. When it comes to managing rhizoctonia, there are several different things, you know, we always talk about, you know, there's no single thing that works for this. We just need to have an integrated approach. The crop rotation, you know, most of the growers are already doing a three, two to three year rotation. That's pretty good. But having these uh, small grains such as wheat or uh, barley or anything in the rotation prior to sugar beets, I think that's your best bet for keeping the inoculum low. Early planting is not in our hands. You know, if mother nature is favorable, then you know, you just go ahead and do the early planting because when the soil is cooler, rhizoctonia is not really uh, active. And the three main things that we can do that are in our control or uh, selecting a variety, or doing some at planting fungicides, whether it's a seed treatment or infra fungicides or a post emergence fungicide. You know, one thing, right, if you want to grow sugar beets, you know, rhizoctonia is something I think that have, we have to live with. 
But if you got to make, pay your bills and then, you know, make some money, I think you just need to invest a little bit of money in, in, in taking care of this beach from Rizak Chonia here. So the, the trial that I'm going to talk about, you know, the major objective for this was to determine the best combination of a seed treatment or inferral and or post-emergence fungicide sites using the two different varieties here. So basically we looked at the stand counts early on during the season uh, and also the full season effect, uh, especially when we go to the harvest. So a little bit of methods. Uh, we did this same trial at three different locations. I'm very thankful to Mindac Farmers Cooperative and Southern Minnesota Beach Sugar Cooperative for their valuable help and cooperation in conducting this trial. And we used a split split plot design with the four applications. So our main plots were uh, varieties. We got a partially resistant variety with the rating of 3.7, you know, that's the best thing you could get right now in the market. And the susceptible variety for Rhizoctonia with the 4.4 rating. When it comes to at planting treatments, we had nothing on the seed or in the furrow. So basically that's nothing. And then only Sistiva on the seed at five grams rate, Quadrus in furrow at five, nine and a half fluid ounce. This is applied as a dribble in furrow on Sistiva. And there's another treatment where we only applied Quadrus in furrow but no Sistiva, this was only done at NWROC because you know that's the additional treatments. We don't have room at other places. And in terms of post-emergence treatments, uh, had no post-emergence application or a four leaf stage or eight leaf, but we don't have a treatment with four and eight. So it's either four or eight. And again, this was applied as a seven inch band at 14.3 fluid ounce. So if you're just curious about you know, how it's applied, it's not a broadcast. And then uh, prior to planting, what we did was uh, we uh, multiplied Rhizoctonia on these whole barley grains, and then we broadcast at 50 kilograms per hectare. You know, that's how we try to uh, replicate uh, and reproduce the disease pressure in the fields. I'm only going to show data from the Northwest uh, Research and Outreach Center and the Southern Minnesota location here, NWROC. Uh, the planting times were uh, just you know, close to what the growers have done. Uh, but aside from Hindak Farmers Cooperative, I think it had good rainfall in the same two varieties. But I don't know, just like Dr. Seeker said, you know, they're doing very good for Sir control. They must be doing something else for Isaac Tony. I had a hard time getting any disease pressure at their site. So with the between four and eight leaf applications, you know, it's always about June, you know, 10 or 12, and then June 25th, again, two different dates. And the harvest is, you know, a little bit earlier compared to the growers, you know, uh, to get everything out of the ground. In terms of data collection, we did the stand counts, like I said, early during the season, and also the root rot ratings at the harvest. We rate about 20 roots uh, using a zero to 10 scale with a 10% increment all the way to zero to 100%. And uh, yield and quality parameters were done uh, at the quality lab um, in uh, East Grand Forks here. And we looked at the main effects for the cultivars, at planting treatment, and the post-emergence, and also two and three-way interactions for this. So the, the weather, right, that the weather is going to drive how the rise of is going to pan out during the season. So at the NWROC location, I think the striking thing was the rain in July, that's seven and a half inches. The 10-year average was about 3.3 inches, right? That's just going to tell something. Because you have the heat in the July, all you need is the moisture to get the road track. In Southern Minnesota, I think June, July, and August were a little bit favorable. I think it's probably maybe close to normal or a little bit over than the normal in terms of the rainfall, right? So let's get to the data here. The two varieties uh, in Crookston, pretty much all the way from one week all the way up to eight weeks, there's actually no difference whether it's a 3.7 or 4.4 varieties in terms of the number of uh, plants, the stand counts for 100 foot of row here. I mean, stands are good. When it comes to Southern Minnesota, I said, you know, we got good moisture early on. It planted, you know, on May 9th. Uh, we did see that it's a numerical difference between the resistant and susceptible variety, you know, higher stands for the resistant one, but, you know, statistically, it's not really significant. But overall, excellent stands, even the susceptible one, right? I mean, it's under 200, but about 170 or so. When it comes to at planting treatments, uh, I'm just going to walk you through quickly here. Uh, the green line is our nothing on the seed or nothing in the furrow in Crookston, right? So you see the lowest number of stands here. And the purple one here is actually quadris in furrow only. And the red one on the top is a cystiva with quadris in furrow. 
and then the blue one is just the cystiva, right? So what happened just a week after planting, really no difference, but by two weeks after planting, we could see some difference, you know, where we applied quadris in furrow, the stands were a little bit lower compared to cystiva or cystiva and quadris. But overall, I think both cystiva and cystiva and quadris had higher stands compared to quadris, which is a little surprising because in 2019, I had lower stands for both cystio and quadris and also quadris treatment applied in furrow. So I wonder, you know, why this is happening. We were just a little bit of dry in 2020, but we are not as cooler as uh, now 2019. That's the major difference. When it comes to Southern Minnesota, basically cystio and then quadris in furrow and cystio, you know, they had almost very similar stands compared to the untreated. Again, they did pretty good uh, compared to the untreated one there. Again, typically I don't see any stand reduction in the Southern Minnesota area there. And when it comes to the effect of the post application on uh, recoverable sucrose per acre, I have the resistant variety and the susceptible variety. So we got about uh, 350 to 450 pounds increase for the resistant variety compared to 950 to 1300 pounds for the susceptible variety here in Crookston. Again, this is applied as a band, whether it's a four or eight leaf uh, stage. And we did see some two interaction between at plant and also the post emergence application here. Uh, when it comes to untreated, we got about 1100 to 1500 pounds increase in RSA with the post applications. With Sistiva only about 1300 to 1400 pounds. With Sistiva and Quadris just about 700 to 900 pounds. But again, just a little bit of different results here with the Quadris in furrow only, nothing on the seed. There was not really any benefit just doing a post application. Again, you know, numerically it's a little bit lower compared to our best treatment right here. And looking at the at plant and post interaction on the root rot, really, you know, the amount of root rot that we saw was very high when there was nothing on the seed or cystiva only. But once we did four or eight leaf application, there was less uh, root rot that we saw in these treatments here in Crookston. And between comparing the two varieties uh, in Southern Minnesota, basically there was less disease in the resistant variety. There was a higher sugar and the amount of roots, the percent of the roots with the root rot were lower. And then RST was also higher for the resistant variety. You know, everything is statistically significant here. But when it comes to the, you know, the biggest difference is the effect of the post-emergence application on this um, in terms of the lower root rot, for a four or eight leaf, but actually eight looked even better than the four because you know the whole season was favorable for disease development. Again, the same thing reflected in the person roots infected uh, with rhizoctonia and also about seven ton increase in yield with the post applications there. The same interaction was also observed at the Southern Minnesota location, whereas the response from the resistant variety was much higher, you know, almost up to 1300 pounds increased for the resistant variety, about 2,400 pounds for the susceptible variety with the four or eight, but you could see you now eight was even better because the, the variety was so susceptible for this. So looking at summary, uh, the varietal selection, it makes a big difference. Uh, but again, if you have moderate to high disease pressure, you know, it's very critical. Most of the seed treatments are really good for early protection, whether they're applied uh, individually or in combinations. When it comes to infra application, I would say the protection is from early to mid season, but there could be some stand loss under drier, cooler conditions. But what we saw consistently with the infra applications, you do get some stand reduction, but you know it tends to maintain during the rest of the season, at least from up to the mid mid season. When it comes to post emergence application, I would say you know four or eight. Don't think about soil temperatures. You know just go ahead and get your quadris application or anything similar to that. Uh, that uh, I'll just show in the coming slides what's coming. But we, when you're having a susceptible variety, the most important thing, you know, if it's okay, with well, the moderate disease pressure, I think seed treatment and a post application should help. But if you have a severe fields with the rhizoctonia history, I think you have to do every possible thing to protect the plants there. Um, one, um, one. Sure. Okay, um, um, thank you. Uh, and then, you know, We'll uh, actually take a uh, deep dive into several different topics for the grower seminars. So just please add them to your calendar, uh, several different interesting topics there. 
With that, I would like to thank the R&D board for uh, funding this research, uh, the cooperatives for their support, the seed, and then the germanes for uh, doing the seed treatments and the quality labs. And uh, last but not the least, you know, for my team for going above and beyond in 2020 to get everything done on time. So I can be uh, uh, thankful enough uh, for their help. Okay, thank you. Which is a qPCR based detection and genome assembly of a Phanomyces cochleoides. Uh, the, uh, the speaker is Jacob Botkin. Okay. Uh, Co authors uh, Corey Hirsch, Frank Martin, and Ashok Chanda. Okay, so that's me again here. Sorry, Jake could not be here. Uh, he just oh, wanted okay. downtime just this week. Uh, so I'm going to play the recording of his presentation. So PCR based detection and genome assembly of Phanomyces cochleoides for the 51st annual SBRB meeting. This work was done by me, Corey Hirsch, and Ashok Chanda from the University of Minnesota NWRC and Department of Plant Pathology, and our collaborator out in California, Frank Martin, with the USDA. I'll be going over a background on sugar beets and Aphanomyces root rot briefly, and then diving into our first objective, qPCR based detection of Aphanomyces, and our second objective, de novo genome assembly of Aphanomyces cochleoides. In the United States, sugar beets are a dominant crop with 32 million tons harvested and $1.3 billion produced annually. The Red River Valley accounts for 51% of this production in the eastern part of North Dakota and northwestern part of Minnesota. American Crystal Sugar Company is one of the companies that is involved with growing sugar beets and extracting sugar from them. They estimate that $10 million is lost annually due to Aphanomyces root rot. Aphanomyces root rot is caused by Aphanomyces cochleoides, which is a soil dwelling water mold. It is in the Umycota phylum. It used to be considered a fungus um, and it causes several diseases. The damping off of seedlings, which is an acute disease and Aphanomyces root rot, which is a chronic reoccurring disease. This affects sugar beet, spinach, chard, pig's weed, lamb's quarters, and fireweed, which are all in the Amaranthaceae family. In the soil, this pathogen exists in an oospore state, which can be dormant for years and germinate into sporangia in favorable conditions when a host is present. These sporangia have zoospores on the end, which can swim through soil water using chemotaxis attracted to root exudates and infect the roots of sugar beets and then produce the oospores in the root. The symptoms of damping off are a necrotic hypocotyl and absence of wilting, which leads to the death of seedlings. For a phanomyces root rot, the chronic phase that could reoccur throughout the growing seasons when there's enough soil moisture, this results in a necrotic tap root that has the characteristic wine glass shape and water soaked lesions. The foliage can be stunted yellowing and having a scorched appearance. To manage this disease, producers use methods like early planting, improved drainage through tiling, plant resistant varieties, they line fields and then use crop rotation. Seeds are often treated with tachygarin which is a fungicide that prevents the damping off phase of this disease, but there are no fungicides in use for the chronic phase. Our first objective is the qPCR-based detection for this pathogen, Phanomyces cochleoides. The current assays for Phanomyces are a bioassay and water culture assay. The bioassay on the left is for infested soil, it is where you have a naturally infested soil and you plant susceptible sugar beet seeds in it. And over four weeks, you pull out the ones that are symptomatic and then diagnose them under the microscope to determine the root rot index of that soil. This can miss inactive phanomyces. The other method is a water culture assay on the right, which is for infected plant material. And this is where we take the infected plant material and we place it in a agriplate of water and over two to four days we observe structures that grow out of it looking for those zoospores and zoosporangia. 
This can miss Phantomyces coicoides in overgrown plates. The rationale for our qPCR assay is that it's a DNA-based culture-independent method. qPCR is a technique, quantitative polymerase chain reaction, that allows us to detect the DNA of a specific organism in a sample. So we are going to use this technique to develop the qPCR assay because we believe growers have a need for a sensitive, accurate, and rapid assay to make informed management decisions. The research outline for this project begins with getting infested soil and infected plant samples. Then we'll do the bioassay on infested soil samples and the water culture assay on infected plant samples to determine the amount of phantomyces present and if it is present. Next, we will do the DNA extraction and qPCR assay. We'll extract DNA from both our naturally infested soil samples and from our naturally infected sugar beet samples. And this is an image here of me setting up the qPCR assay on the right. This will allow us to measure the amount of Phantomyces DNA present in our soil and plant samples. When we did this for 10 soil samples collected from 2019 and 2020 in the Red River Valley area and Southern Minnesota, our qPCR assay detected a Phantomyces in all of our samples with a CT value ranging from 28 to 36. A low CT value, say 20, would mean a high amount of Phantomyces DNA. And a high CT value, like 38, would mean a very little amount of Phantomyces DNA. We did the bioassay on these soil samples to get the root rot index, which ranged from 86 to 100 for our samples. And currently we are working to be able to correlate the CT value that the qPCR assay generates with the amount of aphanomyces spores per gram of soil samples. We also tested this qPCR assay on mature sugar beet tap roots. We did this first by visually evaluating the sugar beets and determining if they had symptoms for Phantomyces root rot. Jason Brantner at the University of Minnesota Sugar Beet Plant Pathology Lab did this and found that 78% of our samples appeared like they may have Phantomyces root rot. We next did DNA extraction from a piece of the tap root, and we also did a water culture assay from another piece of the tap root indicated by the blue and red square in the image. The qPCR assay determined that 63% of our 60 sugar beets had Phantomyces DNA present, and the water culture assay determined that only 15% of the same sugar beets had active Phantomyces growing in them. In conclusion, for this project, we were able to validate the assay on both infected plant and soil samples. The assay is sensitive, detecting 0.1 picograms of DNA, and fast can be done in just a few hours. The cons of this are sampling issues and soil inhibitors. For sampling issues, sometimes you can sample the same soil sample and get different results. And for soil inhibitors, we often have problems doing DNA extractions from soil and getting clean results. Our next objective was to do a de novo genome assembly of Phantomyces coicoides. The rationale for this project was that there is no genome for this species currently available, and this would allow us to do comparative genomic and phylogenetic studies to help further understand how this pathogen fits into the broader landscape. It would allow us to understand virulence factors. How does a Phantomyces create disease in plants? And it would allow us to develop new diagnostic assays. For this project, first we need to do a DNA extraction and sequencing. Then we need to do the genome assembly and finally the annotation. For DNA extraction and sequencing, we first grew the tissue and then from that aphanomyces tissue, we did the DNA extraction using Kyogen's genomic tips kit seen here on the right that allows us to collect very long strands of DNA that we call high molecular weight DNA. This resulted in 10 micrograms of high molecular weight DNA. 
we took this DNA and we used it for both long read sequencing using Oxford Nanopore, which generated 24 gigabytes of data. And then we used the same, same DNA for short read sequencing using Illumina. For long read sequencing, Oxford Nanopore technologies detects the base pair by its electrical current going through a pore called the nanopore. And this is done on very small sequencing devices like the MinION. And this is relatively new technology that allows us to get DNA sequences in millions of base pairs. Short read sequencing we did using Illumina technology, which is a little bit older technology, but it is much more accurate. And this detects the base pair by imaging fluorescent labels attached to the base pairs. This results in DNA sequences of 100 to 300 base pairs. In order to do the genome assembly, first we needed to filter our long read data to just take out all the poor quality sequences and the short reads. Then we assembled it. And in order to do the assembly of the genome, the assembler software first takes all of these DNA sequence reads. And then it finds the overlaps between them and then generates a consensus, which is a segment of DNA that we call a contig. And the genome is consisted of contigs or segments when it's finalized. Finally, we need to polish the assembly and then we generate our short read data, filter it and use our short read data to error correct our long read assembly. Finally, we need to annotate the genome and we annotate the genome in order to classify all the features, such as what are the genes, what proteins do those gene makes, where are the repetitive regions, and what do they look like. The goal of this is to understand the biology of the organism. And this will allow us to classify the genes and the products that they make and determine the virulence factors, such as what proteins is a phantomyces secreting that allows it, that allows it to be a pathogen and affect sugar beets. The results of this project are that we estimated the genome size to be 82 megabases. Our assembly size is 75.9 megabases, which is distributed in 109 contigs or segments, with the N50, the average contig, being around 2 million base pairs, and the longest con contig being around 4 million base pairs. BUSCO, which is a measure of genome completeness, was initially at 91%. And once we polished our assembly, it's at 93%. When we do the error correction, we hope to see this improve further. Finally, we mapped reads from other Phantomyces isolates to our assembly and found that 99.89% of them mapped. In conclusion, our genome is 92% of the estimated genome size, and the genome is similar in size to related species. Our N50 is large compared to other similar assemblies. Our cons were that the High molecular weight DNA extraction was challenging and that assembly software can be slow and resource intensive. Thank you. Well, Ashok, I hope you can tell Jacob that he did a very nice job on that presentation. Uh, there is at least one question there that I'm hoping you can answer offline. Um, I think it's time to move on to our second Phantomyces presentation. Uh, that and that is a Phantomyces root rot of sugar beet current and future perspectives, uh, given to us by Samantha Rood and Ashok Chanda as a co author. We see your presentation, okay. Samantha. Great. Um, so, the title of my talk today is A Phantomyces Root Rot of Sugar Beet Current and Future Perspectives. First general introduction, um, a Phantomyces cochleoides is the causal agent of a Phantomyces root rot. It is an oomycete or water mold, and unlike other um, plant parasitic oomycetes, a Phantomyces is in the saprolineales lineage, which just practically differentiates what chemical controls it's susceptible to. A Phantomyces causes both a seedling, damping off disease, and a chronic root rot. On this slide, I have the life cycle, which shows in any given season, oospores in host tissue are the primary inoculum. Motile zoospores swim to root exudates. They require high amounts of water in soil for swimming. They, um, because they swim to root exudates, aphanomyces is a post-emergence stamping off disease because it needs a plant to be there. And then infection will happen. 
infection can happen at any point in the season as well. In terms of symptomology, the diagnostic symptom that we see in the um, seedling disease is darkened hypocaudals that have a thread-like appearance. They become quite skinny. Because the stems and the hypocaudals are very weakened and delicate, plants become really susceptible to death or damage due to wind. In older plants, foliage will be chlorotic and it tends to wilt throughout the day and then often will recover at night or under periods of high water. Scarring and scenting of roots is common, especially um, malformation can also be seen in roots that have recovered from infection. In infection at any point in the season will lead to yield loss and decrease in extractable sucrose and increase in the amount of impurities. In terms of disease incidence, aphanomyces is common anywhere that sugar beets are grown, especially in the Red River Valley area, as well as um, Southern Minnesota. As you can see from this map from 2018, um, only the dark green squares are free of aphanomyces. So aphanomyces is quite common. Part of that is because of the fact that the pathogen can survive in fields for up to 10 years. So once you have aphanomyces, it's difficult to get rid of. And as you heard in the last talk, aphanomyces can sometimes be difficult to identify um, when it's present in a field if you don't have infection. During se um, seasons that have warm and wet conditions, we can see major losses occurring. So improving drainage using tiling can be a helpful way to mitigate disease risk. But infection can occur at any time in the season that conditions are right, even if they're only right for a small amount of time, you can still see appreciable stand losses occurring due to infection. So because it's an insidious pathogen that hangs out in soil waiting for the right conditions, it's important to continuously use control methods to mitigate how much disease you have. There are a number of factors associated with the amount of loss that we see from a phantomyces root rot. The number one is probably weather. Um, the second is what seed treatment is used. Cultural practices and resistance of the variety planted are also important. Tachigarin is the only available chemical control for this pathogen. It's very effective in decreasing the amount of um, seedling damping off that we see. However, because it's a seed treatment and it doesn't last all season, we tend to now see a more chronic root rot and less of the seedling phase as the um, tachigarin stops working throughout the season. Cultural controls are a really effective measure and those can include things such as incorporating factory waste lime into soils, which um, a lot of work has been done showing how long that can benefit and decreasing the amount of phantomyces you see in fields. Crop rotation is also helpful and so is weed control. Um, uh, there are over 30 species of plants that can be infected by phantomyces and serve as reservoirs or hosts. So that could be plants like spinach and other beet species or weeds such as lamb's quarters or pigweed or carpet weed. There are commercial varieties with resistance or moderate resistance, but there are none that are completely immune. And because of the fact that um, sometimes you can have a uh, high resistance in a variety comes hand in hand with a yield penalty. It's important to um, weigh decisions between how much risk you think you might have and how resistant a variety is. There has been some work done in Phantomyces coecliorides, understanding how isos differ, but there's been considerably more work done in a different species of Phantomyces, Phantomyces eutyches. Um, and so Briefly, some of the interesting things that have been found in that pathogen, which is a pathogen of legumes, is that populations within a singular soil sample are a mixture of phenotypes and genotypes. So isolates differ in terms of how virulent they are and how aggressive they are. What's more interesting and potentially more concerning is that the frequency of highly virulent isolates of Aphanomyces eutyches, so that is race two isolates, has been shown to be unrelated to cropping history. So basically, researchers have found a phantomyces, very virulent isolates of it in fields that have never been planted with a host plant. So these very uh, virulent isolates exist anywhere that a phantomyces does, and it doesn't seem that we have put any selection pressure on them to exist. So there's a lot of um, genotypic and phenotypic diversity in isolates. We assume that the same thing is probably true for phantomyces coecloides. We do know that the phenotype of one isolate does not affect the phenotype of another isolate within the same field. 
but we don't have a great scale of how diverse isolates are on a regional or global scale. This is important because we want to be able to use information about how isolates differ to improve our control methods. We want to understand how isolates might vary and how susceptible they are to chemical controls or how long a resistant variety will actually be resistant in the field based off of how isolates differ on a soil sample level. So pivoting from the current state of aphantomyces to future research objectives, I'm going to be walking you through some of my objectives that I am going to be starting as a first year PhD student. The first one is mapping of genomic regions of sugar beet associated with resistance to aphantomyces root rot. For this experiment, we are partnering with Dr. Kevin Dorn, who is a research geneticist um, of sugar beets with the USDA ARS. And we're planning on genotyping and phenotyping USDA populations of sugar beets um, to, and using either genotyping by sequencing or genome-wide association studies to identify what genes might be involved with resistance. What we do already know is that um, there have been some resistance QTLs or quantitative trait loci identified for um, this pathogen. However, we don't have a full picture. They either have a minor effect, they haven't been incorporated in lines, or in some cases, we actually don't know what that gene codes for. So there's a lot of um, avenues for us to research to understand more about how many genes are involved with resistance, where they are, what they code for, and hopefully we can identify resistance genes, create markers that can then be used as a proxy for screening um, to more quickly go through uh, variety screenings to identify resistant lines. My second objective is to identify potential clades of Phantomyces quickleoides within the US and on a global scale with respect to genetic structure. In this case, this might be exper experiments that use uh, genotypic and morphological characteristics of isolates to look at diversity and population structure. So in that case, what might happen is a plot like the one on this slide that shows the amount of viable, dormant, and dead oospores produced by different isolates. We know that isolates differ in a variety of ways. We want to look at isolate diversity um, off of practical traits like the number of oospores or zoospores, things that uh, affect how disease progresses in the field and understand how that might be influenced by where isolates are, as well as cropping history or cultural practices um, to really get a better picture of what's going on in the soil and what aphanomyces isolates are like. My third objective is to characterize the virulence of phantomyces isolates using USDA germplasm with varying levels of response to phantomyces root rot. This case, we are planning to use differential lines of sugar beet to characterize our isolates. So we would expect an outcome like the table on the slide showing different varieties and different isolates. And by pairing them together, you can see how isolates differ in terms of what plant or what variety they're susceptible on. This is how we determine races in, well, plant pathology in general, but especially in Aphanomyces species. Or, yeah. Um, and understanding how isolates differ in terms of virulence is very helpful for understanding how um, different virulent isolates are distributed in fields on a regional or global scale and identifying areas that we need to be focusing on or isolates in particular that we should be worried about when it comes to breeding for disease resistance. That way we can make sure to be um, focusing on isolates that have the potential to become major problems in the future. And by identifying how isolates may differ, that can help us to understand if there are multiple mode of actions for genetic of resistance on the side of sugar beets. So you kind of need them to go hand in hand, diversity in isolates and diversity in sugar beets. Moving forward, we're hoping to deepen our understanding of aphanomyces root rot of sugar beet advance, by advancing our understanding of the genetics of disease resistance and improving our ability to screen plants for resistance in a more high throughput manner. And by increasing our knowledge of the genetic and phenotypic diversity of aphanomyces isolates on a regional and global scale. With that, I'd like to acknowledge my funding from the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Minnesota Dr. Kevin Dorn, and of course, my PI, Dr. Shek Chanda. I'd be happy to take questions or in the chat or on here. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, excellent talk. Um, 
you do have one question. I think in the interest of time though, I, if you wouldn't mind taking that offline, that would be great because uh, you've now gotten us right back to being on time. Okay. Um, and then if you could stop the screen share, that would allow our next speaker to prepare himself. Um, so this is a new face, I believe, for our reporting session. This is Carl Strasbaugh, who is a research plant pathologist with the USDA in Kimberly, Idaho. And he will be talking about incidence, distribution, and pathogenicity of fungi causing root rot on the top of sugar beet piles in Idaho. Carl, it's all yours. Okay, Melvin, thank you. And thank Mohammed for including me, including me in your reporting session today. Um, in Idaho, um, in sugar beet piles, um, we, we store approximately two thirds of our sugar beet roots. Um, at harvest time, about a third of our crop can go directly from the field to the factory. Um, a third of our crop goes into what we consider short-term storage or about 90 days of storage. And the third of our crop goes into long-term storage, which can last all the way to the end of March, beginning of April. And so you can see from this particular slide, um, some of this, this steaming fungal infested spot. If you get a hot spot in your piles outside, um, they, they can be related to fungi. Um, if your pile develops a hot spot and it falls about 10 feet from the original 20 feet, um, that those roots are no longer usable at that point. And so these hot spots can be um, pretty good size to remove. Um, an average size house will fit into the hole in the pile when some of these are removed. And so the situation can be serious. And so we've been investigating uh, the fungi inside piles and also on the surface of piles. Okay, well, we'll proceed. Fungi in, on outdoor piles is our objective. Um, previous research, um, we've looked at investigating um, what occurs inside piles. And it was obvious at that time, um, we didn't have time to expand the, the study to include the surface of piles because the surface looked completely different than what was inside. And so that's the objective of this study, the focus of it. Um, so we were looking at the incidence, distribution, and pathogenicity of fungi in two different types of piles piles with ventilation and tarps, which are our longest term piles, and then our shorter um, storage term shortage storage piles, um, we do not utilize tarps or ventilation for those types of piles. So with that, um, you can see from the bottom of this slide that we had seven locations where we had both types of piles. The tarp and ventilated piles are in the green bars, the blue bars are where we have no tarps or ventilation. And the vertical axis, you can see that we um, have the percentage of root surface area with rot. And what we did on top of the piles were break it up into a three by three grid. And within each of the nine squares, um, we took a one meter square area where we assessed um, all the root surface area for fungal rot. And so the average of those nine locations is what you're looking at here. And so if we look at location six, um, you can see with the green bar, we had up somewhere around an average of 40% of the root surface covered with fungal growth. And I'll cover in a minute just what the different fungi are that we're finding. But total fungal growth um, is, is pretty significant. And you can see that by comparing that location six to location two, that we do have significant differences between locations, um, both within a pile type and across and between pile types. Um, location two ranked the best, um, regardless of whether they were tarped and ventilated or not. And you can, and this was for the 2018-19 storage season. So I'll switch to the next slide. And this is the 2019-2020 storage season. And you can see um, we had considerably more rot. If you look at location six, um, the green bar, we're topping out at around an average of 90% of the root surface being covered by fungal growth. 
So obviously these roots on the surface of the pile are impacted considerably by fungal growth. However, if you compare it versus location two, again, as in the previous year, um, both pile types are sniffly better um, and rank number one as the best pile um, both years. And where we have no tarps or ventilation, um, those ratings would have been taken around the end of December. Um, you can see we have almost no fungal growth, um, even though it was a fabulous year for fungal growth compared for some of the other locations. And so if we find the right location and have good roots, healthy roots coming into the pile, um, it is possible to store roots under ambient conditions and have re relatively little fungal growth. Um, this gives you an example of what a root um, might look like after 60 some days in storage. Um, typically, um, at that point in time, um, Cladosporium species are the only thing and that's dominating um, the root surface. And that's what you're looking at in this particular slide. And so other fungi that we see um, don't appear until later in the season. So by the end of December, we would have put these roots in the pile beginning in early October through the end of October. And there is more fungal growth on the roots that are piled first in a pile, as opposed to those piled last. And so by the end of December, the roots will look like this. However, and, and this is another view of a platys platysporium species on the root surface. And if you contrast that with what the roots may look like typically after 120 some days in storage or twice as long, um, we have a mixture of fungi. We still have cladosporium dominating the system. However, we also have botrytis, um, penicillium. And if you look at off to the left side of the slide, you see sort of a, oh, a spider web um, kind of look, a white fungus. Um, that's an athelia-like basidiomycete. So here's an example or close up of what um, Botrytis scenario looks like. Um, it's a brown powdery appearance um, on the root surface. Um, in indoor storage piles, um, this fungus is the one that dominates both inside an indoor pile and on top of an indoor pile. Um, Botrytis um, will dominate in that kind of um, storage situation. Outdoors, however, um, it is less dominant and equal into about equal in its prevalence um, and coverage in comparison to penicillium species and the athelia-like species. Here's an example of penicillium, what it'll look like in storage, more of a blue-green powdery kind of fungus. And the athelia-like basidiomycete, um, it was mentioned earlier whether um, diseases in the field and could lead to issues in storage. Um, we do find a correlation between the presence of this fungus that you're looking at and the presence of rhizomania in the field. And so prior to having rhizomania in Idaho, we first had rhizomania in 1992. So prior to that, we may not have seen this fungus in storage because it's pretty hard to imagine someone missing um, that root on the left looks like a ball of cotton candy. It's hard to imagine someone not seeing that in an indoor storage pile. Under humid conditions, that cotton candy kind of look is what you see. On the right, you see more of a spider web appearance of it and the kind of a more of a flat kind of crusty kind of growth. Um, still white in appearance, but under drier conditions outdoors, this is more typically what it looks like. So if we inoculate um, isolates of representative isolates for each of the fungal types that we found um, from these roots, um, inoculate them back in, put them in storage for about 60 days, and then measure the amount of root rot that we get. Um, this picture slide shows about 17 of the isolates in the study. The study actually included 30 some isolates. The ones not shown on this slide um, produce no rot and they were all cladosporium species that were being evaluated. You can see here from the right side of the slide, 
that some of the cladosporium species here um, produce relatively little rot, um, almost just barely better than the non-inoculated check, really. Um, if we go a little further across the slide, you can see we do have one Altenaria atro isolate that we included. Next to that, we have two Penicillium cellarum isolates that are sniffly better or sniffly worse, um, depending on your viewpoint, at causing rot. Um, Penicillium polonicum and expansum are the next isolates that are increasing in pathogenicity as we move across the slide. And the most pathogenic um, isolates we had were Botrytis scenario. So that gives, gives you a little bit of perspective comparing the different types of fungi and storage and the amount of rot. And that is an average of two years of studies and the studies were not significantly different. So the, these data were analyzed together. Now, if we look at the Cladosporium species, I mentioned that you know, in those slides I showed earlier in total fungal rot, um, regardless of whether it was the tarp pile or the untarped pile, Cladosporium species dominated. And you can see here by the list of species that I found, and this is just from the 2018-2019 season, the, cur the current year, the most recent year, um, is still a work in progress at this point. Um, but 2018 and 2019, the Cladosporium cladosporioides species accounted for 66% of our isolates. And the Cladosporium subtilissimum was 17%. So those are the, but by far the Cladosporioides um, species was the dominant species. Um, you can see I highlighted some of them in red. Um, these particular species are also known to be associated, associated with human clinical samples. And having sequenced several genes from the, these particular um, species, um, they were very close. In other words, the sequence identity was between 99 and 100 percent. So essentially the same thing. Um, so with that in mind, um, if you do have individuals that are working for you and they're immunocompromised, um, you would it'd probably be um, a good idea not to have them on top of some of these storage piles, um, particularly later in the season when there's a lot of um, fungal growth present. Um, some of these, these isolates of fungi um, for an immunocompromised individual um, might be of concern. For a healthy individual, um, these fungi are not that pathogenic and should be of little concern. Um, Penicillium species, if we look at um, the three that what we find typically in sugar beet piles, um, we 84% were Penicillium expansum, Plonicum was 10%. Um, inside a sugar beet, this is on the surface of the sugar beet piles. If previous work, when we looked at inside the piles, cellarum was about 30% of the isolates and expansum was about 60% in those studies. So in conclusion, cladosporium species, um, particularly the cladosporium cladosporioides um, was 66% and the primary fungus found on top of the sugar beet piles, um, regardless of whether they were early season or late season. Location two in our study proves that roots can be stored long-term under ambient conditions if you can find the right spot and put healthy roots into the pile. So with that, um, thank you to Amalgamated and BSDF for assisting in, in making this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, we have time for, I'd say, one question. Hi, Coro. It's an excellent presentation. Uh, the one that you just showed with the cotton ball, the ethelia, is it close to sclerotium rauxii or something else? Ethelia bombacina is the fungus that it's closest to. Um, and there, it, it likely represents um, a new fungal species. Um, it may actually, from what the mycologists tell me, even represent a new fungal genus. So it does, that's why we call it athelia-like. 
because the closest thing to it is a theliobombacina. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Kimberly Webb. She is with the USDA in Fort Collins, Colorado, and she will be breaking down the interactions of sugar beet with Rhizoctonia solana. All right, Kim. Are you guys able to hear me and see my slides correctly? You're good to go. Okay, perfect. So it's been a couple of years since I have talked with you. And so what I'm really hoping to do is just update the group on some previous projects that you had provided funding for and what we've done on these projects in the past couple of years. So I'm actually combining these two projects into a single talk. I apologize um, because of that. We're not gonna be able to get into a whole lot of detail on them. But if there's any questions after I get done, please email me after the sessions and we can definitely talk in more details. Um, the first project was um, trying to detect and quantify the amount of R. solani that is in the soil that is needed to cause disease in sugar beet. And then the second project was characterizing the interactions of Rhizoctonia and solani with sugar beet and the different biological mechanisms that might be going on that could increase disease severity or also induce resistance. Um, I'll get started with the first project, which is detecting and quantifying the amount of solani that's necessary to cause disease. I wanted to um, shout out two of my collaborators on this project, uh, Dr. Kirk Broders, who was formerly with Colorado State University, but is now with USDA in Peoria and Dr. James Woodhall, who is at the University of Idaho, as well as some combined funding that he brought into the project from the Snake River Seed Alliance out of the Idaho group. Um, we all know Rhizoctonia diseases in sugar beets, um, so I'm not gonna go over the symptoms as much here, but I do wanna highlight that what we consider as common Rhizoctonia diseases are caused by different kinds of Rhizoctonia solani. And when you're trying to detect these pathogens, it's really important to understand these differences because your detection methods may not pick everything up. So in our case, um, we definitely see Rhizoctonia solani. Um, most of our diseases are caused by AG2-23B, but there's another AG2-2 Roman numeral four that can also cause disease um, in sugar beet. And they can cause both the seedling damping off, but they're more known for causing the Rhizoctonia root and crown rot. Um, some work out of Linda Hansen's group is starting to show that there really isn't too many genetic differences between these two subgroups of 2-2. So we're really not sure what the differences of are in those two different um, subgroups at this point. Um, I can talk about a little bit more when we start talking about the detection. The other one that tends to be a common um, concern in sugar beets is R. solani AG4. And that usually is associated with seedling damping off. But I'm going to reiterate that any of these species can cause either of those two disease symptoms in sugar beet. As we know, um, seedling damping off can primarily be managed by um, seed treatments when you're planting in, um, in your crops. Um, and you can also apply fungicides at the later stages to better manage the crown and root rot symptoms. However, um, genetic resistance is still a primary requirement for most of our production regions. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that it appears that resistance for the adult stage Rhizoctonia crown and root rot is different from the resistance for seedling damping off. And so we need to do a lot more to better understand what that resistance is and how they are working. So one of the biggest things that we have to keep in mind when you're trying to detect and quantify how much of a pathogen is soil is the disease cycle in each particular disease system. For sugar beet, um, the main sources of inoculum typically can be from sclerotia, which are these overwintering um, condensed particles of mycelia, or the rhizoctonia can actually colonize organic matter such as leaves, leftover roots, things like that in the soil. And it's these particles that then overwinter and then cause disease later on in your systems. 
each individual particle is considered an infective particle. And so when you're trying to determine how many fragments of this pathogen is out there, you have to be able to count the number of particles. This can be complicated, particularly with organic matter, because it depends on the size of your piece of leaf that it's colonizing. And if that leaf suddenly gets torn into two, instead of one infective particle, you suddenly have two infective particles. We really don't know how many infective particles are needed to cause disease in our fields. And this particularly comes up in our disease nurseries where we actually artificially inoculate our fields. And you'll often hear a lot of our scientists talk about, well, we had a really hot inoculum this year. Well, what does that mean? Did you just have more particles that had more colonization of the fungus or did you have a more virulent isolate? Typically, it means that you just got better colonization. And so whenever you're throwing that, those barley grains into your artificial inoculum into your field, you're actually just getting more disease because you have more infective particles. So many of us don't actually count how hot our inoculum is before we go out and um, do our disease studies. The reason being is it's really difficult to do this. Um, you typically have to sieve the soil to get your sclerotial fragments, or you actually have to do a serial dilution series of your soil plate the soil out and then count the number of fragments that actually germinate mycelial pieces. And this also comes into piece when you start talking about detecting them with a PCR assay, we can't really quantify how many particles there are because you're counting the amount of DNA that's there. So the purpose of our study was really trying to better idea of how many particles cause disease and what is the corresponding DNA amounts that we could then detect to correlate your infection level. So what we did is we originally started out using some pre-published um, primers that um, industry-wide we call the budge primers. And those have been released for the Rhizoctonia solani um, complex to detect the, detect the different anastomosis groups that we're talking about. The problem with the budge primers is they've been known to actually cross react with some of the different um, anastomosis groups in some of the relationships. And there's a very closely related subgroup to our pathogens, which is AG2-1. And the budge primers are known to cross react with these 2-1 species. So we decided to go ahead and develop a new set of primers that we developed off of the Genome that was re genome and transcriptome that was published by Weiberg et al. in 2016, where they had some putative um, pathogenicity genes that they found in that genome that was not in any other genome of the Rhizoctonia solanii that they looked at. And so we developed a primer based off of one of those genes and screened up to 50 different Rhizoctonia solanii isolates and compared them to the budge primers. And we found that we were able to detect only the 2-2 isolates and our primers did not cross react with the 2-1s. Um, this is just a quick uh, subset kind of showing some of that data where with a standard PCR, we were able to get a fragment amplified using only our primers and it did not pick up the 2-1 isolates. We then increased the number of isolates to 100 and we confirmed that with a broad range of species and um, different Rhizoctonia anastomosis groups. After developing a quantitative PCR assay that we could then use for soil, we then actually wanted to try and determine, can we correlate this with inoculum densities and then how much inoculum is needed to cause disease in sugar beet? So what we did is we, colonized barley with um, Rhizoctonia solani and ground it into small fragments. We then mix it into the soil at different rates and concentrations, and then put the soil into individual flats. We then would plant them with our different sugar beets um, and then allowed the sugar beet seedlings to germinate and counted the ones that germinated as well as the ones that ended up surviving and not damping off. 
We then collected the soil from these different treatments and then used our PCR assay to determine if we could detect them. So in our original development of our PCR assays, we found we could detect about 1.2 picograms of DNA per treatment. Um, but we're not able to quantify that even though we could detect it. So the PCR reaction did amplify a fragment, but we couldn't quantify the DNA react reliably. And that's what you see on the left-hand screen. Um, we actually have two graphs here because uh, the University of Idaho validated the test and found, came up with basically the same curve that we did in Colorado. So we felt like the test was fairly sensitive. When they then used the assay to detect the pathogen at different concentrations in the soil, we were able to re um, reliably detect and quantify the um, particles at two infective particles per gram of soil, which ended up being about um, 0.2 nanograms of DNA. Um, and that's in the top graph. And the lower infection level of only one infective particle per gram of soil, we were still able to detect it, but there was too much variability in the assay that we weren't able to reliably quantify the DNA that was contained within that sample. As for how much inoculum that's needed to cause disease, um, the first study that we did, we did a range of sugar beet germplasm. Um, each fragment on the left hand panel on the left hand side are different germplasm of sugar beet. And we inoculated the soil at two infective particles up to 200 infective particles per gram of soil. We use this very high rate because that is what we suspect whenever we artificially inoculate our, our fields for our disease nurseries, you tend to inoculate with a much higher level than natural amounts. And we wanted to determine what is the minimum level of inoculum where we could still get uh, susceptible plants in the field. And so when we did this assay and comparing it to the uninoculated treatment, which is the black bar, uh, we were able to um, get a reduction in disease up to 10 infective particles per gram of soil. On some of the varieties that we tested, if we inoculated at only two infective particles per gram of soil, we still got disease. So that's telling us you don't need a lot of rhizoctonia in your field to actually get disease. In our second study, we really found out that we had way too much inoculum going up to the 200 infective particles per, soil, uh, per gram of soil. So we changed the inoculum loads to one infective particle, two and 10 per gram of soil. And this time we also included some resistant lines. And in this study, we found out that yes, we could still get disease at two infective particles per gram of soil. But the interesting thing was on resistant lines, once you got up to 10 infective particles per gram of soil, you started to lose effectiveness of that resistance. And so if you have higher concentrations of Rhizoctonia solani, then we could actually be breaking down our resistance. Um, because I'm running out of time, I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to combine it all in. But if you have any questions on the metabolomics, um, please email at later date and we'll try and incorporate that at the later time. Thanks a lot, Kim. Uh, very nice talk. It's, I'm happy to see there's some light chat on the molecular differences between these uh, Rhizotonia subgroups finally. Um, <laughs> do we have time for one question, I think? What type of soil did you use, Kim? Um, for these studies, we did use a potting mix for this. However, Dr. Woodhall is actually um, now working with field soils and trying to increase the sampling so that we can increase it to um, actual being able to use this for field detection. We do lose sensitivity of the assay. You can still get detection though. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Kim. Our next speaker is Dr. Linda Hansen. She is with the USDA in East Lansing, Michigan. So I'll be talking about something that's showing up in Michigan. 
Uh, that's alternaria leaf spot. And comparing it to what we've been talking a lot about, uh, Cercospora leaf spot, I do want to say that uh, Dr. Jamie Wilbur, who is the extension potato and sugar beet pathologist in Michigan, and Daniel Bublitz, who is the extension specialist for sugar beet, also participated in some of this. Now, we talk a lot about Cercospora. It is the most important leaf spot of sugar beet, but we do have a number of other spots as well. You can see this beet here. We have a lot of Cercospora, but we have some others. And this is the one that we're starting to see some issues with, alternaria leaf spot. You've seen a lot of Cercospor characteristics. This is just a little reminder for comparison. A couple of things that haven't been talked as much about, but when we're looking at alternaria for comparison, we are particularly interested in, are that Cercospor tends to be more randomly distributed over the leaf surface. It's also, as mentioned, a warm temperature pathogen. It causes disease, up to about 96, we really see it slowing down anywhere above 96 Fahrenheit with most of the growth stopping around 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But 65 to 96, you'll see Cercospora. In contrast, alternaria leaf spot can be all over the leaf, but we often see it concentrated around the leaf edges. It can cause a variety of uh, colors for the lesions. They'll usually be a light center with a darker edge. When they coalesce, you may not see those individual lesions, which often are still visible for Cercospora. When they're small, they can be fairly circular, but they often become quite irregular. The uh, species that can cause it include Alternaria brassicicola, which is reported in the Western United States as a pathogen, as well as Alternaria alternata and Alternaria tenuissima. Now, there's some question, which I'll go into a little later, about whether Alternaria alternata and tenuissima are actually different species or not. So we're currently calling these the Alternaria alternata species complex. We have a wide temperature range. We can see Alternaria anywhere from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit with an optimum of 68, a little lower than Cercospora. It's promoted by anything that causes leaf yellowing, including yellows viruses, fusarium, nutrient deficiencies, or even host genetic yellowing. It's also found fairly commonly on leaves that have been in contact with soil. We've seen quite a bit of it when we've had drought with leaf collapse during the day and coming back in the evening. It produces these very dark club-shaped spores uh, in infected material. When we look at the spores, you can see Cercospora with these silvery needles and alternaria with these dark spores. They're usually formed in chain for either alternaria and tenuissima. And you can see they're much shorter than Cercospora, darkly pigmented with a number of cross balls. Historically, alternaria has been a minor issue in the US as well as Western Europe, but it has been a major issue in areas like Turkey, Pakistan, and the Ukraine. In 2010, we started to get it on our radar in Michigan when a close to a quarter of the spots coming in for end of season fungicide sensitivity tests had alternaria spores. A technician and student running EC50 plates, when they were finding anything with EC50s above 20 parts per million that year, were finding alternaria rather than Cercospora on their fungicide plates. We thought it was a curiosity, but then over the next five years, we started getting more samples to both the USDA lab and the MSU Diagnostic Clinic with alternary leaf spot. These were including one or two fields per year, with as much or more alternaria as Cercospora. These were particularly coming in. This figure here shows um, historical risk management with the red area high risk for Cercospora, yellow area moderate risk, and green area low risk. 
And it's in these green areas where it was low risk for Cercospora that we started to really get the reports of alternaria coming in. Then in 2015, we found all widespread alternaria leaf spot. Certain varieties were especially prone, but this was found in all of these growing areas, not just in the green zones. It was more common in the yellow and green zones for Cercospora. That may be in part because if you have a lot of leaf loss to, alter, to Cercospora, it's harder to see any other leaf spots. Um, but these problems have continued through 2018 where about 30% of our foliar leaf spot samples have been coming back as alternaria with about 60% as Cercospora and maybe 10% some other leaf spots such as bacterial leaf spot and other things like that. And these are causing enough leaf loss to be um, impacting yield. 2019 and 2020, we've had less disease. Unlike Minnesota, North Dakota, 2020 was a fairly low leaf spot year for us in Michigan. Most of the rains stopped more in the west, or west of us, and we didn't get nearly as much. We actually had some drought conditions for part of the year. So both Cercospora and Alternaria were much lower in 2020. Some considerations we look at diagnosis. Cercospora generally has higher sporulation on the upper leaf surface and alternaria on the lower leaf surface. So if you're looking for where the spores are produced, you may want to turn the leaf over if looking for alternaria. Now you'll see the change when the leaf edges start to curl up, you'll still see it on what was the lower leaf surface. We also can have mixed or coalescing lesions with both Cercospora and alternaria. Shown here, you've got your nice silver Cercospora spores, your alternaria spores, and they're running right into each other. Alternaria is able, at least the strains we've looked at, are tolerant to Cercospora and are able to grow in these Cercospora lesions. That can cause some complications where, uh, depending on your temperature, you may see more Cercospora spores or alternaria spores or both. This alternaria is what we're calling alternaria alternata species complex. Back when I first started, all small spored alternarian chains were generally called alternaria alternata. Then these were separated into different species based largely on the branching of chains with alternaria tenuissima having unbranched chains, alternaria alternata having highly branched chains, and alternaria arborescens having moderately branched chains, and then some other uh, species as well. However, genetic evidence um, does not support separating alternaria tenuissima, alternaria alternata, and some other species like alternaria mali. These uh, have not been genetically um, identified using multiple gene regions. Arborescence can be separated, but some of our others cannot. This is particularly a consideration because when we want to look at host range for host rota crop rotation, it's important to know where else our species can infect. Alternaria alternata, the old sense, has been reported to very, have a very high, wide host range, but tenuissima has been reported a more uh, limited host range. But so the question comes, are, which way do these beet isolates go? And what we found is isolates from beet can cause disease on dry beans, on potato, on tomato, and on apple. And isolates from bean and potato can cause lesions on beet, bean, potato, and tomato. So this would agree with a broader host range, unfortunately limiting what may be able to use for resistance management and crop rotation. We do see, have looked at impact of the leaf spots on yield. Unfortunately, the place we did this test is in a red zone for Cercospora, so we were unable to get any alternaria alone. We did get Cercospora alone or Cercospora with alternaria, and with a lot of fungicide use, 
we ca our controls had less than um, two lesions per plant in this particular year for Cercospora or Alternaria. You can see Cercospora alone and the Cercospora and Alternaria both reduce the uh, yield and purity, but the Alternaria increased the loss of sucrose in our samples. And that uh, has been consistent with what was reported back in the UK with Boothlord's work. Our management, now we're looking at a combination of cultural management, host resistance and fungicides. Both Cercospora and Alternaria survive on crop residue with Alternaria much stronger saprophyte. It's found often on dead tissue of non-hosts as well as host plants, but for both bearing infected tissue is reported to degree, decrease the inoculum levels into your next, following seasons. Host resistance is present. Variety, we have varieties that vary in their response. Current testing is primarily observations when there's natural infection in the field, but we're working on developing inoculation methods. We're getting separation between resistant and susceptible varieties in detached leaf assays. And we are seeing increased infection with our inoculations in the field. We're trying to move into more uh, circo less Cercospora susceptible or less Cercospora heavy regions for screening. Unfortunately, this year uh, with COVID-19 restrictions, we were not able to move our disease nurseries. We're hoping to do that in the future. In Pakistan, they have actually screened and reported resistant varieties. Most of those are not approved for use in the US, but we're looking at some of those as well as USDA germplasm. There are very few fungicides labeled for Alternaria, but several of the ones labeled for Cercospora do show efficacy. We used EC50s with spiral dilution gradient plates. Looking at tetraconazoles, most of our Alternaria isolates show a fair amount of resistance. And field testings with these have shown that uh, tetraconazoles are not particularly effective for alternaria management. For QOIs, we see some uh, highly resistant and some moderately resistant, but this, uh, these are giving some of the best management to alternaria in field trials. Tin, we do see some isolates that have maybe a little bit of tolerance but the majority are sensitive at field rates and tins are also giving good alternaria management in field trials. So we do see evidence for potential for resistance development. It's certainly been found in other crops. So resistance management practices are strongly recommended if you're using any of these fungicides for alternaria resistance. And we, we try to reduce reliance on fungicides alone. QOIs, TINs, and EBDCs all have good to moderate to good efficacy against altering area leaf spot with DMIs being less effective. Thus, the current recommendation is to include some QOIs towards the end of the season when altering area becomes a greater issue in the cooler weather and uh, keep the DMIs for early season. And also consider whether if you're going into cool season, look more at alternaria management, warmer temperatures, your Cercospora will still tend to predominate. However, alternaria on highly susceptible varieties can still spread even in warm conditions. High humidity and prolonged dews or leaf wetness both favor disease we also see higher alternaria following drought and insect damage, particularly leaf miner damage. And consider alternaria hosts such as tomatoes, potatoes, et cetera, as rotation crops, as well as in back gardens and several weed hosts. I'd like to thank uh, our funding sources, Beach Sugar Development Foundation, Project Green, the Research and Education uh, Research and uh, Extension Advisory Council from Michigan and Michigan Sugar Cooperative.
Thank you very much, Linda. Very nice talk. <clears throat> we have time for a question or two. Uh, I did get one message to me. And the question is, does abiotic stress increase risks for alternaria compared to CLS? Um, some abiotic stresses do certainly do. Nutrient deficiencies um, are definitely a predisposing factor. Nitrogen or manganese um, deficiencies, both uh, when you get yellowing from those, we also see increases in alternaria uh, issues. And then droughts, um, drought when you actually have leaf, uh, leaves lying on the ground. We saw a, a lot of increase in our alternaria on those and any leaves that had been in uh, contact with ground for several hours during drought. Interesting. Okay, any final question? If not, uh, I'd like to thank the speakers for uh, giving great talks today. It's clear from this last session that there are no shortage of pathogens of sugar beet. And we had a lot of diversity in, in talks on various pathogens and it was all very interesting. <clears throat>